بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream on a spicy Wednesday midday uh, in this great state of New Jersey where the uh, sun is out shining the weather is I would say spicy because it's got a tinge of humidity just enough to um you know, make you feel a little bit sweaty, but also you need the air on and it's, it's hot. So, but it's very nice out. Uh, sun is always better than no sun. Today it is Wednesday, which means it is affairs of the Ummah. That's what we're on today. And we begin with the uh, news.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen out of Australia, brothers and sisters, listen very closely from all my Lebanese friends in Australia. Muslim preacher warns it's haram to watch the Matildas. Now, apparently this news outlet found this so bizarre, so comical, so crazy that they decided to write an article about it. Okay. Um, but when I listened to it, I didn't see anything crazy. I think that this brother, Taqi Din Muhtadi, I t- agree with him. A simple reason, it's haram to look at the aura of another woman. Uh, in Islam, like it, don't like it. Your liberal friends are going to cringe at that. Well, tough luck for them, right? I'm uh, sorry to, to say that, but that's the rule. And you join a religion and that religion has rules, right? It's forbidden for uh, the opposite gender to look at each other's aura. Is that so bizarre? On top of that, Taqiyya Dean says something we all understand too. He says, yeah, they may be carrying the Australian flag. But he says, pretty funny, he says, they're all alphabets. Right, and so you're liking, supporting. Now he also addresses another point that's very important: that any time someone brings something up, they say, "Oh, it's this is a minor matter, right? This is a small matter." And he addresses this very well too, where he says that is not all of our record of deeds on the day of judgment small deeds that compound. Nobody should in Islam say that this is a small matter because all of our lives with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consists of small deeds. No one's going out there establishing the khilafah. No one's going out there ab- 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 abolishing poverty. What you're doing is you may abolish poverty for one person for one day, right? You may um, talk about something uh, related to the khilafah and educate one person on one mas'ala, right? But... If you think about what the, uh, the the behavior of a Muslim is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam trained his Sahaba on is that we should be looking out for all of our small deeds. And if everybody does that, we, tr- we have a whole different community now. And then we have the ability now to rise up to higher things. But there is no such thing as one big master plan and let's only talk about the big issues of the world. No, where Islam is, is, is practiced by individual human beings whose the, your definition as a Muslim is your compilation of your small deeds. The collectivity of your small deeds, that's what you are. So when the brother addresses small deeds, well, also, he's not exactly writing a PhD thesis. He's making a 40-second TikTok video. So it's not like he's taking a, 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 a PhD thesis uh, on a small matter or what people deem to be a small matter. Rather, he's also treating it very simply. Let's listen to the brother because I personally, um, and, and, then, and then let me tell you something. They contacted the National um, Council of Imams and the National Council of Imams says, we don't comment on individuals' um, social media posts. Hold on a second. Way to go and just tossing your brother to the to the wolves. Why don't you say, yes, we don't comment on everyone's because we're not going to set a precedent for that. However, the ruling that he stated is a ruling in Islam. And the National Council of Imam upholds the ruling that a Muslim is not allowed to look at people of the opposite gender for no reason. Okay, And we're not allowed to be supporting, liking, whatever... Um, people who may have a view that is outside of Islam. So let's listen. So what is this about? This is about the Women's World Cup. Hold on. How do you, we got to get this? You know, they do the, you, 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 you click play, but the thing's on mute. Their default is on mute. All right, let's go to this brother. Taqiyya Din Muhtadi. Anyone know him? Tell him that we here at the Sphinx Society, nothing but facts, live stream said, well done. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khairan. Here, let's go to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 
commanded us to lower our gaze to the opposite gender. Did we forget this? And not just this, subhanAllah. Yani, did we forget who was supporting? They might be hiding under the Australian flag. But the reality is, subhanAllah, these people that you are supporting, you're liking their posts, you are sharing them, you're commenting on their posts. These are people of the alphabets, the majority of them. And they're pushing this agenda through the athletes. When your kids are looking at you, share, supporting them, sharing them, they think it's okay. But hold on, are you worried about this? But your actions are, subhanAllah, showing something that's different. You're going to say, brother, you're too extreme. Tell you a small thing. There's more important things to worry about. You know what? Maybe. It's a small thing. But did you forget that the mountain is made up with small pebbles? So, no, uh, so you know, they wouldn't really have commented until I see this newspaper here try to bully him, make fun of him, and all that stuff. So, uh, and, and put quotes on stuff. You know when they put quotes on something that you know they're trying to make fun of it? Uh, or what have you. So we got to give the brothers some support. Unlike his own National Imams Council. I don't know who's on there, but they just threw him to... Well, we don't comment on anyone. Uh, all right, let's new move on. Omar, do we have our guests ready? All right, we shall experiment with our guest, Sheikh Nur al-Din, who has studied with all the, the great and the legendary Ulama Isham, and he is out of the city of Luton, whom we went to in 2005 when Habib Omar bin Hafid came to the big mosque in Luton. Uh, Sheikh Nur al-Din, take two with Sheikh Nur al-Din. Ahla wa sahla wa marhaban. Uh, welcome to the Safina Society podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi All right, let us test uh, everyone on YouTube. Can you hear Sheikh Nur al-Din this time around? We are good to go. Alhamdulillah. Omar and Noah troubleshooted. They... They troubleshooted for about an hour, and that's why we got a late start, because they troubleshooted for about an hour. Well done by the guys, uh, Omar and Noah, for doing the job. Now, let's start all over from uh, what we were doing a couple, uh, a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Nur din is the Imam of Luton. Can you tell everyone where you teach? Because one of our uh, interview um, uh, sort of selection is based on young Imams who are physically and online teaching people so that people can get to know who these imams are and they can start studying with them. So why don't you uh, kindly tell us where do you teach on site in Luton and where online? Okay, so uh, let's start with online. Online, I have an organization called Islam Answers. Uh, on that platform, I teach. On the website itself, it's primarily written. Uh, so we have, I have answer questions and the answers are written out with the Quran and hadith uh, adilla <coughs> as well as classical scholars and that's something that i really try to emphasize a great deal quran hadith and classical scholars when you obviously everybody agrees on quran and hadith but classical scholars this mm -hmm. moves us away from sectarianism and it brings us to something which is more uh, unifying inshallah um, so I have that. Um, I also have uh, channels on the social media, YouTube, others, uh, etc. And I teach there as well. Um, I have uh, classes almost every day, which are live streamed, as well as in person. The classes are, uh, at the moment, very often at my house. Um, we are at Islam Answers. We are in the middle of trying to acquire a, uh, an institution, inshallah, a physical uh, building where we will have our institution based in Charlotte Ella. Uh, sometimes I teach in Masajid, so I teach um, what I'm about to in Charlotte Ella start a course in Bandu Masjid. At the moment, it's a, it's a lecture series that will become a course in, in Bandu Masjid. Uh, in Luton, I sometimes teach at some of the local Masajid, have talks and such things. In the past, I, it's, it's not, it wasn't a university uh, course, but we hired the university premises and I had some courses there as well. Uh, various places, um, community centers, etc. But inshallah, inshallah, in the near future, we will have a physical building, a physical center. At the moment, much of the teaching is out of my own house. Okay, so uh, Banbury Masjid, islamanswers.co.uk, and classes are at your house. I'm on the website now. There's a retreat I see here in the advertisement to Istanbul, September 20 to 24th. How can some of our nothing but facts uh, friends and family here uh, attend. 
Inshallah, if they go onto the website, even on the homepage, they, they will find a link for the Istanbul retreat, also for the upcoming Umrah, Inshallah. Dana. But uh, Istanbul retreat it gives me an opportunity to link up with uh, a number of my teachers as well, because many of the scholars of Damascus have moved to Istanbul. Can you tell us who, for example? In, on the course itself, at the moment, we have uh, Sheikh Mujir al Khabib, who is a mm. teacher of mine. He will be delivering a lecture, and Sheikh Khalid Khassa. He will also be delivering a lecture. But the third person, I haven't uh, quite decided who uh, I'm going to invite at the moment. Um, we'd like to have a range of different scholars, inshallah. Ta'ala. So I have a couple of names in mind, but I haven't approached them yet. Good. So but there will be a third one. Excellent. So Sheikh Khalid Kharsa, who I met last uh, trip, I did not meet Sheikh Mujir al Khatib. Al Khatib is a big family in Damascus. Um, they have there are many ulama with the last name Al Khatib, and Sheikh Mujir al Khatib recently, to broach our topic, had to retract his name from a document uh, regarding a fatwa that was um, not to his agreement that he did not agree with. And I think nobody agreed with. And I actually feel really bad for the person who authored it because they must be going through some kind of, you know, um, emotional and mental crisis. The whole basically Islamic fiqhi world has basically, um, you know, dumped out their fatwa into the garbage. But it calls for us to think about this idea of, of publishing fatwa. You said that what you publish is answers to questions from the books and you provide the 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 the, the evidence from the nusus so that people could see what the evidence is not just pure taqlid of the book fine but these are questions that are established questions as opposed to new matters so when we say fatwa if you ask somebody does bleeding um, nullify wudu this is not a new matter. This is a question that's been around for hundreds of years. So we can go into the different books of the madhabs and provide you with the nusus and the evidence, right? So that's not a problem. But when there's a new matter that's coming up, that's where it's a sensitive issue. And that's where a lot of people like to run and, uh, and, and, and give an opinion. What I had said earlier is that there has to be a methodology in our community where we sort of judge where, where people actually put out there why is it that you should trust me right and not only that i'd like to add to that when a person actually issues a fatwa it'll be a very good idea to put down to have your shiuch read it in advance of the publishing and put their comment about the fatwa in advance of it being published right and that way, people would actually uh, trust the fatwa even before reading it. So can you comment on the need for some kind of law and order when it comes to publishing fatwa? And by the way, yeah, if, you're on, uh, if you're on Instagram, come over to YouTube because your Instagram you're going to see just the empty space between me and the sheikh. Uh, but come on to YouTube, Safina Saidi uh, YouTube channel, and you'll be able to hear everything, see everything. Yeah, this is an absolute necessity. When you have new issues, no doubt, contemporary scholars are going to have to tackle them, and I agree with yourself absolutely. Mm -hmm. When you have established masail, then we have to go back to the books. You know, that's where the authority lies. Fine, some people may misunderstand or misinterpret, um, and that can be clarified, inshallah. New issues is it, far more difficult because. When we speak about the classical works, there's, by and large, there is agreement where the authority lies. Is this an authoritative work in the madhab? Is this not an authoritative work? By and large, you have agreement. When it comes to contemporary issues, one of your concerns is then going to be, who are the authoritative contemporary scholars? Uh, and that's why uh, I try to emphasize as much as possible Whenever it's a non-contemporary issue, go back to the sources, because at least we're all united and unified there. But yes, my approach is the following. Whenever it's a contemporary issue, I believe we should try to go to the most senior scholars available, inshallah. And that, again, people will differ over that. You are somebody who studied in Medina, uh, who are the most senior scholars of the world today, the, the fuqaha, and have a different answer to me, who, who studied in Damascus and a little bit in Tarim. Um, 
to somebody who studied in Karachi, for example, they, they're going to have different ideas with regards to that. But there's still, you know, there's some understanding that these are the people who have been teaching for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. You know, and they recognize, at least in their community, maybe not worldwide, as people who have some skill, some authority with regards to it. So uh, I, I practice that on Islam answers. When I find that something is a contemporary issue, um, what tends to happen, I have the answer. I have the answer with the, uh, the adilla, uh, with some relevant nas, because of course we're not going to have a direct nas. Nas, for those who are unfamiliar, is a text from the classical works some relevantness, and then at the bottom, a list of uh, scholars. Usually, with Hanafi issues, I, I tend to reach out to five or six different scholars. Um, uh, a list of those who have um, replied to me and said, yes, this is the answer, or yes, we agree with this answer. Uh, whenever we have a, a contemporary issue, I have that. Even if it's something which is, um, you know, you have some basis for it in the classical works, but it's slightly different, somewhat different, I tend to do that, and I feel this is best practice. But I don't rely on the title Mufti alone. Uh, that it can be misleading. You said you mentioned last week that, or the last time when we tried to do this, is that a lot of people receive the name Mufti after finishing an academic course with actually yes. very little life experience. Um, yes. And that seems to me one of the issues is that uh, a word is uh, it's just a title that's passed around. And sometimes you look up and someone's like 22 years old, right? Yes. Uh, he barely reached Baluch last decade. He reached Baluch last decade. That's okay. actually the truth, right? He literally has not been Badakh for 10 years and he's given the name Mufti. Now, we know that in the past, there have been ulama who attained uh, 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 the rank of Mufti very young. But in today's world, just to study the contemporary issue oftentimes takes an, a great amount of secular knowledge. Like some of these contracts that are bought and that are used to finance things and finance homes, the language of the contrast itself, uh, uh, sorry, of the contract itself may need a decent amount of time studying it, right? Uh, medical matters need plenty of time to examine, right? To actually understand what the actually, what is actually happening here. Um, oftentimes related to food and the chemical transformation of things. So there's, unlike in the past, it seems like this day and age, a lot of secular knowledge, worldly knowledge, is needed before fatwa can be uh, 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 disseminated. All right, so... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. And also, it's one thing when you're in the madrasa, you're studying... Um, you know, there's a particular curriculum in front of you, particular books and such things. It's another thing when you're in the community teaching or in a madrasa teaching and you're constantly going back to those books, uh, referring to different works, how it varies, how the answer varies. There's an, it, life experience is absolutely important, fun, yeah. of fundamental importance. And an understanding of the issue at hand itself is incredibly important, but also having had enough time to become familiar with the works, I, I'll speak from the Hanafi perspective, become familiar with, uh, you know, the, 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 the commentaries on Al-Hidayah, for example, um, to become familiar with the works of Ibn Abidin, Rahimahullah, it's one thing to just read through it in a class, it's another thing to go, go back into it, dip into it again and again and again, and compare one nas, one text to another, to a third, to a fourth, and to really take that time, you need time, you need years to be able to really uh, hone that skill and gain that knowledge. So, uh, and this can differ from culture to culture as well, because in subcontinent culture, it seems like very often that is the case, that you'll graduate from a particular program, you have the title Mufti. In Damascus, in my experience, absolutely not. They rarely use the word Mufti. Um, Mufti is only, I've only really seen it used when it's an official position. Mm -hmm. The government uh, position. The Mufti of Damascus or the Mufti of Sham. Other than that, you can have great, great scholars and those be known as Sheikh Fulan. Yeah. Abdul Razak al Halabi, for example, yeah. he was a Mufti, no doubt, but he wasn't referred to as Mufti. Yeah. He wasn't referred to as, you know, in our culture, say Mufti Saab. Yeah. He was referred to Abdul Razak al Halabi. Now, let's talk about another thing is that fatawa are not binding in any way shape and form they're only acted upon they only have any value if you will if the reader willingly acts upon it okay 
Otherwise, it's just ink on paper. So one of the reasons why the other factor beyond your education and, and your certification is experience and trustworthiness in the community is because before you give an edict for people to act upon, there needs to be a track record of trust in that community, right? And this is where some of you sort of get puzzled because they may be totally correct on a fatwa and, 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 and knowledgeable on a fatwa, but nobody knows them. In contrast, you may have a person who maybe read a couple books here and there, didn't like formally study, founded the mosque, collects the zakah, helps the poor, raises the shabab, has summer camps for the shabab, does all this stuff, right? Doesn't know a lick of fiqh. And then he gives his own fatwa on a matter, right? Yes. He's totally wrong. The whole community follows him. Why? Yes, it has nothing to do with the what's on paper or what's being the evidence. It has to do with trust. So talk to us a little on the importance of trust. In yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more, subhanAllah. And this is one of the main reasons I'm on social media. <laughs> it's only fairly recent. I think it's been just a, a few years that I've agreed to, um, you know, put, uh, start speaking in a more public realm. And Islam Answers itself is roughly two years old, mm. the website and um, writing there, etc. And it, it's been, uh, in terms of um, the videos, I've been uh, producing videos for a longer period, but, uh, you know, my image on the video is quite recent. I think that's maybe two, two and a half, three years old, because I'm somebody who, who loves uh, the anonymity that you have when you're not a public figure. I really like that. And it's something that was really dear to me. And I did not want to lose that. Mm -hmm. I think maybe for two years or so, I was producing material for the public, be it the, the radio station or be it uh, the Islam Answers or prior to that, the, the channel was, YouTube channel just on my name. I really like that. And I can speak to the people, but my image is not on it. But the brothers who assist me with this, they kept on telling me that, look, unless your image is on it, you're not really going to have much of, much of a reach. Yeah. Not so many people will listen to you. And I gave that up. I made that sacrifice. I sacrificed an aspect of my anonymity because now, you know, I, I will be in the street and people will come over and say, Assalamu alaikum, I know you. Um, I know you from such and such. I know you from such and such. And uh, I prefer the privacy. <laughs> I prefer the anonymity. But the whole purpose is it's exactly as you've said. The reality is if you don't, if people don't have a connection with you, if they haven't seen you before, it doesn't matter how senior you are. It doesn't matter what your credentials are. Um, they will not take from you. Yeah. Um, and so it's incredibly important. And that's you know, one of the main reasons. There are another a reason is I, whenever I came across misconceptions, misnomers, uh, problematic things being taught, fine, in my class, I would raise it to the handful of students that were here and I'd explain why it's wrong. But then that's not getting to the masses. The yeah. person who said this incorrect uh, or taught something incorrectly raised something which is incorrect. Uh, may have addressed 100,000 Muslims in the UK. Yep. And I am addressing, say, 20, 30, 40, 50. Yeah. We're, not, we're, we're going to, um, are we going to lead the masses to those who are spreading misguidance? That was the, the other yeah. factor in it. But yes, absolutely. You, you know, you do need to be a public face. Otherwise, you are reliant on those public faces. Otherwise, a senior scholar, he will only have value if those public faces say, oh, yeah, by the way, he's a good scholar. Yes, exactly. So rather than yeah. his ilm and what he's producing, pushing him for, yeah. it's somebody who has very little knowledge but has the outreach. Yeah. And that's where I see a lot of uh, tulab ilm, okay, uh, get frustrated. And the whole class of tulab ilm and fuqaha, sometimes I see this frustration where um, they, there's a disconnect between the everyday life of the community and those ulama. Now, some, like Sheikh Khaled Kharsa, is very good at bridging that gap. And he bridges that gap. It's actually much easier than people imagine. It's just that you just have to close your book, get up, maybe change your thobe sometimes, because he takes kids, uh, he takes Shabab on, like, camping trips, on boat rides, and he probably at this age doesn't do it himself. You, you know the Sheikh. But he now has a home, a house that is rented out up in northern Turkey. And he says every few months they take a whole bunch of Shabab out 
and they do a whole bunch of things hiking grilling swimming turkey it's um the landscape is very much like Amer- the united states where you have these campouts, you have these hills you have these uh creeks and rivers and streams and you can grill and, and live in a like uh i don't think this is more you know the the topography of england isn't like that point being is that he bridges the gap between everyday life and the way of the scholars and what got my attention to that is that on your website you now have a youth club which makes me think that you're on the same page on the importance of bridging this gap between the fuqaha and the regular people so why don't you tell us about your youth club and 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 how that relates to translating to uh tarbiyah and talim yeah Inshallah, we have a lot more planned. This is uh, often referred to as the BJJ Youth mm-hmm. Club. So out of the local BJJ club we have here, um, we, we're paired up with them. So they provide that, that aspect of the training. And at the same time, there's a lecture that takes place. Although that one, the lecture there is um, delivered by a student of mine. But we're trying to pair between the physical activity and also some Islamic education. Yeah. Uh, Islam Answers is still relatively young and we have a lot of plans with regards to the youth. We want to do more and more regarding the youth. And uh, uh, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my most successful platform is actually TikTok. No way. Um, and the, uh, one of the reasons I'm on TikTok is I've been told that that's a, a younger audience. You know, if you want to get to the youth themselves, that's the platform for it, inshallah. Yeah. Okay. And alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, you know, the figures there were very good. Um, so but that's an aspect of it. But in terms of practical, um, uh, 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 providing practical uh, activities for the, the local youth community, we intend to do a lot more, inshallah. Okay. Yeah. There are many, many plans that we have regarding that. If you look at the, um, uh, and before we move on to my next question, if you look at the, uh, in, in, at least maybe in the last decade or two decades or so, before the Arab Spring, the, there was a group, the Muslim Brotherhood, and I would always see the majority of Masajid, at least from the Arabs, are run by Al-Ikhwan, right? Now, one of the things that they do is they're so much into these the 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 general activity of regular muslims and into sadaqa right so they're they, and that's how they get their authority in the community now mm-hmm. when you now look at their books and their their minhaj ta'limi it doesn't match anything of the uh, any of the curriculums of the past i mean i looked at some of the books and it's almost like um a complete it's almost it was as if it was chosen randomly to be honest with you like on on uh, act, uh, Khilafa, we're going to look at Sayyid Qut. On Hadith, we're going to look at Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, right? Uh, on uh, different, su- any, every other subject on fiqh, it's going to be fiqh sunnah okay? So it seems, there's no menhaj, there's no school in the world that teaches these menhaj, right? A menhaj that looks like this. That's their specific menhaj. So, but they did earn the trust of the community and the love of the regular person just because of the khidma that they did, which is always makes me feel that like that was the th- part that they got right. Forget the political yes. stuff. I'm not interested in the political stuff. I'm talking about the like British and American uh, Arab communities. That was the stuff that they got right. And they did that very well. And they reaped a reward of that. And that is that people tend to follow them when they do something right. So, what I, I would love to see, and this is what Sheikh Ansar, I don't know if you know him, but he's all about this too. He does um, all sorts of sports. He has a so- he purchased a soccer team, right? Um, a youth soccer team, and they play and they have the, you know, their, his, his organization's logo and everything. And they do also boxing and BJJ training. So he's, he's figured that out, and he's doing that. Hifz Quran, homework help, etc. So that active activism in the community is so important to translate your menhaj over otherwise it's just ink on paper right that a few people appreciate which leads me to uh, now yeah if you want to comment on that go ahead Bismillah. yeah uh, just a shout out to al medina 313 i know yep. uh i'm saying incredibly well he's mm-hmm. a student of mine but he's also they also sponsor uh, islam answers 
um, that's uh, you know you're absolutely right. He does a lot of community work. Mm-hmm. Allah most high bless him. Um, but uh, as often as he can, he tries to support um, Islamic educational initiatives as yeah. often as he can. He has the real interest in supporting people of knowledge, people who are teaching in the community to try to support them so they can focus on teaching the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're not distracted by other necessities essentially. I, I really, really do respect uh, his approach to things inshallah that are served the community, that connects the community to knowledge as much as he can yeah. and supports the scholars very well too. Those, those children, they come to do hifs, they come to do their homework. And then if they have free time, then they get to play on soccer fields that he's established or join his team or go boxing and BJJ. Those kids are going to leave when they, like 17, 18, 19, 20, they're, all their youth is going to be with his organization, right, at that building. That's where their memories are formed. And that's where this is what's important, to be able to translate this over and trickle it down. Now, I really i am curious, what is the British obsession with BJJ? Every single masjid I go to organization has a BJJ um, session or branch or whatever it is so what exactly is it is it that it's the most halal popular sport out there is that what it is I think then I'm not too sure I don't practice it myself unfortunately yeah. but um, I think there are uh, three factors in my mind yeah. one is the Yeah, we'll give it a second. It froze, froze there for a second. That speak about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. Here we go again. There's also the aspect of um, some other martial arts have uh, an aspect of striking the face and then you yeah. have things related to that. So it eradicates that. And I think thirdly, there is an appreciation that um, it's very effective. People yeah. who, are, uh, who understand martial arts Many of them seem to feel that in terms of defending yourself, in terms of um, practically using it when needed, it's more effective than other forms, other martial arts. I'm of the opinion of that the Islamic schools need to uh, nix gym, gym class, and they need to establish martial arts, right? Like imagine if, if a kid did grappling for four years in school. And boys and girls grappled for four years in school, right? Then at least they, they go home with the, oh, self, self-defense. What is exactly the, 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 the value of any kind in going to gym class and bouncing balls, right? Yeah. It's good exercise, I guess, but they should be doing fitness. They should be doing uh, some kind of martial art because I actually am of the personal belief, although I don't practice it myself, that to do two years of a martial art, it's almost as important as learning how to read. Just so that in case someone bothers you, you know how to defend yourself. Right now, I got this mentally. I never actually did it and uh, never lived that, that life of martial arts. But in theory, that's my theory. Like, uh, forget this gym class, throwing balls around, right? No, do some martial arts, right? Do running training and martial arts, right? You, you'd come out with kids that are more solid, right? And it's a useful absolutely. thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's something I emphasize a great deal for too, the, the importance of learning self-defense, yeah. uh, especially, some, again, I, unfortunately, I, have, I, I don't practice it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done a little bit when I was younger, uh, not BJJ per se, but um, right now, I don't I have an issue with my knee at the moment as well. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's not the right time to start. Now, maybe it is the right time. Maybe I'm just making excuses. But I, for years, I've been encouraging uh, martial arts. That Muslims, males and females, should learn martial arts. Of course, females with the females, males with the males. But they should learn. Uh, generally, it's very good. It's great exercise. There's the discipline aspect of it as well. Um, and to learn to defend yourself is incredibly important, but especially when you're living in lands where Islamophobia is rife, mm-hmm. then it's good to be able to defend yourself. We're not aggressive, inshallah, but we need to be able to defend ourselves. Let's go now and zoom into some fiqh. How is the Hanafi education and, and the madhab 
different in Syria when compared to the subcontinent or Iraq or Turkey. Or forget Iraq. Turkey, subcontinent, and Syria. That's where we find the Hanafi school. How are yeah. they similar or different? Uh, I'm not too familiar with Turkey. I have mm-hmm. a lot of familiarity with uh, uh, Damascus, uh, per se, and no doubt the subcontinent, although I haven't studied there. Throughout my life, I've encountered people who have. Um, one of the reasons I decided to study in Damascus as opposed to the subcontinent, as opposed to Pakistan, well, two, there were two reasons. The main reason was, uh, you may be aware, there's a significant divide in the subcontinent. You have the Barilbis and you have the, the Ubandis, and I wanted to stay away from that. I didn't want to involve myself in that. And, uh, I felt that whenever you have this because there's a lot of hatred, unfortunately, then, you know, things can become skewed. Whereas in Damascus, my impression was that's not the case. Uh, the second reason was the Arabic language. So in Damascus, I'll, in my daily life, I'll be speaking Arabic and it will strengthen my Arabic, inshallah. So what I, uh, what I suspected was actually true, that in Damascus, they focus more so on earlier works, earlier scholars, agreed upon scholars, classical works, and although no doubt they do teach those works in the subcontinent, but they tend to have more of a focus on uh, more recent scholars. Nice. Scholars d- belong to the Diabandi school or the Barilvi school, um, you know, the, from the founders thereon. They tend to focus mm. a lot more. So I may be quoting from the Hajj of Ibn Abidin or from Fath al Qadir or from Imam al Aini, and they're going to be quoting from such and such from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. That's a significant practical difference, but I don't want to misrepresent in any way. It's not that they don't accept the authority of those works. It's not that they uh, that they disregard them, but usually they will focus on them. And, and they may become upset with you if you contradict their more recent scholars, because inevitably at times, you know, I may be speaking to somebody of a Barelvi background and says, Ahmad Rida Khan, Barelvi said this. I say, look, hold on a minute. Here in the Hashi, it says the opposite. Here in Fath al-Qadir, it says the opposite. Like, yeah, but Ahmad Rida Khan was such a great Imam. You see, that we end up with a bit of a difficulty. And at times, it may be similar with the Diabandis as well, that, you know, I say, look, you're saying this, where are you getting that from? You say, Fulan, from, you know, some 50 years ago. And I'll say, Fulan, from some 500 years ago. And I'll say, look, your own scholars will recognize the authority of those people. So that, that's a, a difference, inshallah ta'ala. Other than that, when we're all working from the same text, we tend not to have a huge difference. The, the Hanafi Madhab is vast. And we, you know, alhamdulillah, we have a great deal of flexibility within the Hanafi Madhab, especially this entire concept of al-qawlani al musahahan that you may, it's not restricted to two opinions, but we have the concept of having, if you have two sound opinions, then the scholar, the teacher, the mufti may give fatwa according to either one of them. So it, it allows us, uh, it allows the broadness of the Madhab to flourish. Okay, let me then ask you, practically speaking, in a subcontinent dominated uh, land such as England uh, and Luton specifically, how do you physically navigate this since most institutions are of the subcontinent and are one of the two methods of the more current contemporary branches of the Hanafi school? So how do you physically uh, handle that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't mean any disrespect by it, but I do ignore their later scholars because As I said, I'm always trying to avoid uh, the sectarianism. I'm trying to bring people together. And for me, of course, Quran and Sunnah, but classical scholars will help us to achieve that. Because otherwise, uh, Barelbi will say, Ahmad Rida Khan Barelbi said this. Adibandi will say, Ashraf Ali Thanui said this. And, you know, they'll they'll all stick to their own. And fine, if it's a valid opinion, no issue, inshallah ta'ala. But... You see that there's a great scope for division there. Yeah. So I'm always pushing for that. I'm always, and the way I will navigate it with them in discussion, I'll say, look, that's fine, but doesn't Imam Ahmed uh, Rida Khan accept uh, Fatawa uh, Hindi, for example? Doesn't he accept what they call Fatawa Shani, the Hajj of Ibn Abidin? So why can't we go to that? Let's go to that. He accepts Al Hidayah. He accepts yeah. the commentaries of it. Let's go to that. Let's go to something that unites us. I'll do mm-hmm. something similar with the Diabandis when I come across 
uh, a difference, inshallah. When there's no difference, when we're all saying the same thing, but from various sources, there's no issue. But when we have a difference, that's what I push towards. I say, look, let's all go back to what's agreed upon. And alhamdulillah, in, in, from a fiqh perspective, I've seen a lot of acceptance there. They'll say, yeah, actually, you have a valid point. I haven't seen too much, in my experience, and people's experience may be different. But in my experience, I haven't seen too much, too much pushback. They'll say, actually, you have a point there. That's valid. Yes, fine. Let's go back to that. I like that. Uh, stay away from the fitan and um, and the ikhtilaf. And so you're actually part of maybe establishing an, a third route of acting upon and studying and teaching and acting and living by the Hanafi school, uh, which is admirable and I think should be uh, promoted. This idea that uh, you're going to to separate out from this uh, from a divisive environment yeah, it, it, it's not without its controversy. <laughs> I mean, course, you always find yeah. hardliners. Yeah. that um, really have an issue with that because they see that, hold on a minute, he's taking people away from where we have them and pushing them towards something more unifying. So it, it's not without controversy. You know, every now and then, you know, I find Al Fulan said, you're wrong, or he's bad, don't study with him. Mm -hmm. He's not on our manhaj. Uh, Fulan said this, but uh, by and large, alhamdulillah, my experience has been great. But you will always find pushback. There's always, always you know, no you're deemed controversial by some. Yeah. I, I feel that's the minority, that's the, the fringe. Are there Syrian uh, immigrants uh, in, in England? Yes, so, from the fr From the, after the war? Yes. Okay. And so do they, have they settled in a specific community? But I think they're fairly, uh, I haven't looked into it in mm -hmm. direct, uh, you know, I haven't researched it, but in my experience, they seem to be around various places. Banbury, which is my home, essentially. That's where I grew up. We have some there. We have you know, plenty in Luton. We have lots in, obviously, no doubt, lots and lots in London. But I think they're somewhat scattered. Up north, no doubt, there, there are okay, there some scholars. MashaAllah. Uh, Omar, can you scroll down on that document? See some of our notes there. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now I'm looking around again. All right, very good. Last question we have here. How does a layman who is Hanafi square the circle of such a wide array of fatawa found within the madhab, especially now that there are many websites? And you mentioned qawlan, musahahan. However, sometimes the fatawa differ. Not fatawa on new matters, just regular Q&A. Differ on the Hanafi school. What should be the go-to resource for a starter? in the Hanafi school. Like when they see this book, they should know that's 100% valid. Okay. Uh, I, think that, I feel there are quite a few questions within that. So I'm going to answer the direct question that you mentioned at the end. Um, I believe that the, the latest book we have that is agreed upon, Hanafis be it in the subcontinent, Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, uh, uh, Syria, uh, Sham, uh, they everybody recognizes his authority to my knowledge and understanding in my experience that's the hash of ibn abidin rabd al muhtar yeah. so um if you see that work then that's obviously authoritative now i have to be very careful not to be so restrictive to say you know that's your seal of approval if you see that it's fine if you don't it's not people do have to study and, and they have to become familiarize themselves with this no doubt, if you see that, fine. And if you see a book earlier than that, then usually that's going to be fine as well. That's, I see that as the, the last work that we have is agreed upon. I'm just going to uh, just tackle another question that's related to it, and I'll be brief, inshallah. Okay? Sure. Um, many of the, the scholars, including one of my sheikhs, Sheikh Samir al Nas, one of my teachers, he, he used to say that uh, Ibn Abidin done us a great favor. <laughs> Uh, as Hanafis, he really did help us out. Why? Because prior to that, it was difficult. It was very difficult. You, you may have to look at 20, 30, 40, 50 different works before you can start trying to work out what the fatwa position of the madhab is. Ibn Abidin, because there's so much acceptance and because of the way he presents Masail, it's made everything so much easier. Now, I'm so, never going to say a scholar, a teacher, a mufti, a shaykh should restrict himself to it, but it certainly does help. It's fairly rare 
that you read something from the Hashi of Ibn Abdin and then you read from other works and you come across something completely new, something you haven't come across. It will happen at times, but it's fairly rare. Uh, I apologize, us? I'm not quite sure if I the question. No, you did, you did. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the life of Ibn Abidin? Ibn Abdin, rahimallah ta'ala, he's uh, relatively late as a, as a scholar, especially somebody so authoritative. He passed away uh, 1252, Hijri, rahimallah ta'ala. Um, you know, he was uh, in Damascus itself. Um, you know, mashallah, a really uh, a diligent student initially. Inevitably, you know, if he's going to become such a, a great scholar, um, uh, to the extent that in his biography it speaks about how he used to have a lesson with one of his shuyukh, um at the Hajjad time, before Fajr. Well. And he used to go to his house and um, uh, the the sheikh, he was uh, generally speaking, he'd be lying in bed at the time. And even Abdi Rahim Allah, he would go, he would knock the door and then the sheikh would start preparing himself. And uh, the story goes that his um, wife said to him, well, don't you, aren't you concerned that if you keep doing this, he's going to stop attending? They said, no, not him. He will continue to attend. He was a very diligent, mashallah. Um, he was sharing for a good period of his life, oh, which is very helpful, alhamdulillah, Ajay. because he will at times bring up the Shafi madhab. And as yourself, you, you'll know when, when scholars, even great scholars, when they mention madhab that, that are not their own, um, there's more tendency to make a mistake. It's not, of course, it's not inevitable. They are great scholars. They're going to be right much of the time. But there's more of a tendency. Because Imam Ibn Abidin was a Shafi'i for a good period of his life, uh, we can have greater confidence that when he mentions the Shafi'i method, it's, it's accurate. And I do tend to uh, check with Shafi'i friends of mine, Shuyu scholars, um, when he mentions a masala. And up until now, I haven't come across a situation where he was wrong. Regarding he will is, be. Everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. But alhamdulillah. Is there a story about why he became a Hanafi after being a Shafi? I, uh, to be quite frank, I haven't researched his biography thoroughly, and I haven't come across one. I, you know, read a couple of biographies uh, of Ibn Abidin, rahimahullah uh, quite a long one at the beginning of uh, what we refer to as the Fadhul copy of the Hashi. It was quite a long yeah. one. I don't recall a story. I'm sure there will be uh, one somewhere. And since he's a relatively recent scholar, if it's not penned down, it might be in the minds of people. Subhanallah. Well, then, uh, inshallah, for next time, uh, thank you so much for coming on. And everyone, again, islamanswers.co.uk, uh, uh, Brett Banbury Masjid, and uh, Sheikh Nuruddin also teaches in his home. So if you're in Luton, ask around. Maybe you can get invited to these home classes. Uh, again, this portion of our live stream is meant to highlight some of the young teachers of Ahl Sunnah who are teaching the Madahib, teaching the Ash'ari and Maturidi Aqidas, and are uh, out and about. He's on TikTok. You can find him there. What's the name of the TikTok handle? I think Islam Answers One. Islam Answers One, the one number one. On TikTok. Yeah. So uh, get benefit, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh Nuruddin. We hope to see you again in the future, bidnillah. And next trip to England, inshallah, we collaborate. Oh my God. All right. Khair. Really? All right, ladies and gentlemen, there we have it. We fixed the problem. We did it. Uh, we had the interview, and um, Alhamdulillah, Mashallah was very good. And thanks to Omar and Noah for fixing our situation. Now, let us turn to our topic today affairs of the Ummah, because we do have a number of affairs of the Ummah. And here's something very interesting. Who here has ever heard of a, a scholar who was in a Iranian Sunni? Because I personally cannot name one of them. I cannot name one Iranian Sunni. Ahmed Z. We are we're, we're, uh, flanked here by Ahmed Z, Ali Starbucks. Omar in the front. Okay. Uh, and we got these butter cookies. Impossible not to eat. Yep. Impossible not to eat. Bismillah. A prominent Sunni cleric has been arrested in so southeastern Iran's Sistan, Baluchistan province. Maulana Fathi Muhammad al Naqshabandi okay, is the Friday imam in Ras town of the Sunni majority province that borders Pakistan and Afghanistan. Oh, okay, that's where it makes sense. That's where it makes sense. Baluchistan. Okay. The bordering town 
on the Iranian side, but these are probably not. Um, they may even speak a different language. Allah, Allah knows best. We're, let's 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 read here. In a statement, the Judiciary Office in Sistan, Baluchistan, said that Anakshabendi has, in recent months, adopted extreme positions and aligned himself with the opponents of the Islamic system. The press release accused him of inciting street riots through his sermons. And that was he was given necessary warnings but insisted on his positions. Okay, the charges against him include disturbing public opinion. Well, what is the issue exactly? Disturbing public opinion, slandering the Islamic Republic of Iran, acting against national security, and illegal occupation of land. Naqshbandi, as well as uh, Zahidin, Friday prayer leader, Maulaya Abdul Hamid Ismail Zahi, have frequently made anti-government speeches in recent months. I think they're like Afghanis like living on the Iranian border. That's what it's, the names sound like. Uh, last October, Amnesty International accused Iranian security forces of unlawfully killing at least 66 people, including children, and injuring hundreds of others outside of Sunni mo- outside of a, a Sunni mosque in southeastern. Where is the West uh, advocating minority rights in Iran? Right? Aren't the Sunnis a minority in Iran? They're all about the minority. Right? No matter who you are, okay? They're all about the minority, which is a ridiculous way to uh, determine things. But uh, there's no, you don't have any, you're not any more moral because you're a minority. You're not any more right or wrong just because you're a minority. In any event, the human rights organization said security forces fired live ammunition, metal pellets, and tear gas at protesters, bystanders, and worshipers during a violent crackdown after Friday prayers. Okay. Another 16 people were killed. Okay, in separate incidences. And last October, Abdul Hamid Ismail Zahi, uh, or Zai, uh, the Sunni leader in Zahidan, recounted a crackdown in a video testimony. He said that more than 40 people were killed. Okay, we still don't know why exactly people were killed. And were they targeted for being Sunni? That's another question. Because, again, people could get killed... All right, people might get killed and happen to be Sunni. You know, like this is we, we read we recently read something like this where people and and it was Muslims, right? Where people claimed it was like Islamophobia or something. But I'm like, wait a second, is it Islamophobia or you did something wrong and happened to be a Muslim? To be fair, right? They blame the deaths on terrorists, rioters, separatists who are acting on behalf of foreign governments. Okay. The province has also witnessed several fatal attacks on security forces in recent months. Iran's population is 95% Shia. Okay. And the remaining population consists of various minorities, amongst them Sunnis, amongst them Christians, amongst them Jews, amongst them Zoroastrians and Baha'is and others. All right. So, so basically the number of Sunnis there... Um, is in fact um, is in fact the at the Afghan border. That's really where it is. And Peter Buckley says this is all wrong. All right. And senior cleric claims religion in Iran is weak. Blah blah blah. I'm not going to go into that. But Peter Buckley is some odd person who is the like the only person who ever comments on five pillar news stories. Okay, so let's forget that. All right, so that's the first news story. Now let's go to another news story. A woman is arrested after spraying... Listen to this. A wo- if I could just get these... All right. Pop-ups off the screen. Women, is, women arrested after spraying uh, a Quran burner with fire extinguisher in Sweden. Hilarious. This thing is continuing. And Denmark is actually going the opposite side. They're like thinking, hold on, we don't want to be like Sweden. But Sweden continues, and many countries refuse to allow a Swedish ambassador into their land, including them Iran, including other countries. Swedish police have detained a woman who sprayed an anti-Islam activist with a fire extinguisher as he staged a Quran-burning protest. So she's just trying to put out the fire. Isn't that what you're supposed to do when you when you're when you see a fire? She did a good deed. Uh, 
Video of the scene showed the woman rushing to up to Selwan Momika and spraying white powder towards him before she was intercepted by plainclothes police officers. Okay. He, rem- he appeared stunned, but unhurt, then resumed his demonstration, which was authorized by the police. Okay. Momika is a, a refugee from Iraq, and he desecrated the Quran in a series of anti-Islam protests that have caused anger in some Muslim countries. Swedish police have allowed the demonstration uh, demonstrator to continue. Okay. Police spokeswoman Tohag said the woman, who was not identified by, by, by police, was detained on suspicion of disturbing public order. Where, why is there any suspicion when she did it in broad daylight? It's like clear, very clear what she did, right? Prosecutors are investigating whether his actions are permissible under Sweden's hate speech laws, which ban incitement and hatred against groups or individuals based on race, religion, or sexual orientation. Okay. And he said, my protest targets Islam, not Muslim people. Well, do you do think that Muslim people care about Islam? Um, so again, these people, extinguish the hate was the motto that this um, group went out with. And they went and fire extinguished these Quran burning protests. All right. So there you have it. A quick summary of what's going on in Sweden. Let's move on now because we have a number of things here. All right, let's move on to Pakistan, where the Muslims there um, rioted on the public display of Christian worship. Right? Members of, now how weird is this? Daisy Christians. In other words, like, yani, I know it, it's there, but personally, you see a Pakistani person, you think a Muslim right away. But now here, there are a growing number of Christian Pakistanis. Okay. So this one says that Pakistani Christians held services on Sunday at churches that were vandalized and torched by vigilante mobs. Uh, that's not right. Okay. Because they do are, they, they are Ahl Dhimma, right? And two of the Christian people were accused of desecrating the Quran, says the U.S. News and World Report. Sir, the services at a handful of churches in the city of Jaranwala in eastern Pakistan were led by the bishop of the diocese, Christian community leader Akmal Bhatti said. He attended one of the services, which drew hundreds of Christians whose homes were partly or completely destroyed when the mob burnt and looted them on Wednesday. The pastors later distributed food rations. Uh, the government said in a statement that they will compensate um, Two million rupees, which is six thousand seven hundred fifty dollars, for all the uh, f- the families that were affected, and they will help rebuild their homes. Paramilitary troops have been guarding the sites of the arson attacks, which is the historic Salvation Army Church. It was a church for, that was handed down from England or something? Salvation Army, right? Uh, and Saint Paul Catholic Church, three small churches and scores of homes. A Christian graveyard was desecrated. Residents and community leaders said that the mob was armed with iron rods, sticks, bricks, knives, daggers, and they went on a rampage without any intervention by the police, and they did this for 10 hours. The police said, no, we tried to stop them. The clerics from an outlawed Islamic party, Tahrik al Bayk, we know about it. If you attended Nothing But Facts on Wednesdays, you know about your international Islamic groups, and this is one of them, Tahrik al Bayk. The... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a group led by Khadim Hussein Rizvi of course he passed away but it's his son who now reads it but they, they denied that they had any uh, 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 took any part in these these riots Tahrik al-Bayk party says that they were not part of any of these riots Okay, so police have arrested two Christian men who were accused of instigating all of this through blasphemy Okay. and saying things that inflamed Muslims. Blasphemy is punishable by death in Pakistan, but no one has ever been executed. Numerous people accused of blasphemy have been lynched by outraged mobs in the past. So maybe don't, don't do blasphemy because you can't control these mobs. All right, a dollar in Pakistan, if you want to give charity, is 296.25 rupees. That is, that's something else. 
cheapest country in the world right now, actually. Yeah. You got the worst. Cu- got the worst currency. Yeah. It's the cheapest country right now. Cheapest. Wow. Like the worst. Yeah, I know there's worse, like Venezuela or something. Oh, Lebanon. Yeah. Well, Lebanon is their currency is with thousands per dollar. Let's move to another story. This is supposedly, okay, a an inspirational story to Muslim youth. Ibi the rapper is his name. He was previously one of BBC's Asian network Future Sound and Voice, has now given up rapping for his faith. Ibrahim Mohsen was tipped as the next big thing on the British Asian rap scene. 22-year-old, known just by as Ibi, was working in grime music. Explain. Grime? Yeah. Grime music for five years, and he had a huge fan base. Hundreds of thousands of hits online. Ibi had previously been one of the Asian Network's future sound artists, but recently he gave it all up. He said this is because he wanted to take his Islamic faith seriously so he could practice uh, that uh, the way he felt he needed to. Okay. There was a point where I was earning £4,000 a month, but I quickly realized that the money I was earning had no blessing. I couldn't feed myself with that money. I couldn't even give any of my money to my mom. While I was trying to practice and make music at the same time, I realized that music cannot be in the same heart as the Quran. By the way, anyone who talks about music and says, oh, there's discussion on music, there's debates, there's kalam. Okay, fine. But show me one Hafiz Quran who regularly listen, listens to pop music. Right? Show me one, just one Hafiz Quran who regularly listens to pop music. You can't. Okay. So, yeah, you want to have an academic debate on it and go and get um, a shokani. And his essay on music, where he lists like three or four quotes here and there on the uh, permissibility of it. Fine, go do that. But also, at the same time, show me one person who has the Qur'an in his heart, who recites a little bit more than إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحَ إِنْ أَعْتَنَكَ الْكَوْثَرْ إِنْ صَلَاهُ Okay. And regularly can recite Qur'an from memory, who also listens to music. Right. But the music that a person may have can have a duff in it and can have something that would not be labeled as a string or a lute. And it can be with the voice. So there is there is some things that people could listen to. And if something slips in here and there at a wedding or something, fine. But it's if it's not something that is going to be every day we're listening to the radio now, we're listening, we have like 55 playlists, you know, uh, with all sorts of pop music on it, and we're listening to this all the time now. That's where you got to draw that line. Ibi says it's not just the making of music that made him feel uneasy, but the lifestyle. To really make it in this industry, you need to talk about what people want to hear. And in this day and age, it's filth. I tried to implement good in my rap, but I was naive. Okay, Ibi, who was a British Pakistani, it says it's not been easy changing his ways and dissing himself from music. Okay, His current... Currently working on developing his career in Nasheeds. He says that he wants to use skills that have lyrically uh, to make music that's halal. Okay. The next thing is to take knowledge from the music industry and bring it to this new thing. I want to be known as the guy for that scene, the goat of Nasheeds. Nasheed is basically like uh, it's, it's an Arabic word for, for, for singing. Ibi also says he's trying to stop others from being distracted by the lifestyle that surrounds music. A young kid came to me and said, you're the reason I quit music. Okay? And that's the reason a guy like me does this for the youth, for the next generation. All right, good job, Ibi. All right. Yeah, get Ibi on here and, 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 and invite him. Why not? We're always looking to invite different people here. All right, what what do we have next? How about this? This is This is specifically American news. Donald Trump, here we go. He's negotiating getting booked at the Georgia jail. And of course, now if you're wondering about this, he's not going to spend any time behind a jail cell. Donald Trump is, um, of course, accused along with 18 others of trying to steal the 2020 presidential election. And he will be booked in Atlanta's Fulton County Jail. But he is negotiating, right, through his lawyers, 
to have this aired in prime time. Okay. So he is the guy is taking reality TV to the next level, a president at court, in court, a president in trial. Because his wild takes and his wild tweets, that ran its course. He did that. He got it, all the attention he could from that. That's it. That doesn't move the needle anymore. Donald Trump says something wild about somebody, calls someone a name. It doesn't move the needle anymore. So he needs to find a way to move the needle. Okay. Because his whole game is, is, is being a ratings machine. So what's going to make the liberal news outlets cover him? What they want to see. Right? The crucifixion execution of Donald Trump. Okay. And so um, they're going to want to see him getting booked, getting, uh, I don't think he's even going to be handcuffed. What he's going to do there, uh, it really takes four minutes, essentially. I think he's doing the whole thing for the mugshot. And he's already beat people to it by putting mugshots on T-shirts, right? His mugshot on T-shirt. But it has like a slogan that's something like, um, they're trying to get to you, but I'm in the way. Right? Like he's the defender of the people, right? Yeah. And that's one of Trump's uh, uh, brand new branding things that they give out and sell at the at the rallies. Yeah, I'm 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 really curious how he plans to win the election with no airtime at all from the mainstream. I mean, they are talking about him, but I just don't see him. On, there's nothing on Twitter. There's it's not moving the needle. There's no outrage. So this is the biggest amount of attention that he's gotten. He's going to be there for four or five minutes, then he's going to leave. And everyone's going to want to see the mugshot, right? So is he going to wear a tie in the mugshot? Is he going to loosen it up and look like he's just been out of a car accident or a fight for the mugshot? And that mugshot's going to be, you know, the mugshot uh, scene around the world. Because this is the moment everyone, his haters have been waiting for. So I think what he's doing is he's playing into the hands of his haters. And it's like, what is it going to take for you to give me more attention, right? What does it take for CNN to have a whole hour on Donald Trump? And then from there, he could start saying things and, 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 and rallying up his base, right? We also know that he's not attending the, the debate. Instead, he will be airing his own interview with Tucker Carlson on Twitter. Okay, that's one of the brilliant things that, that Elon Musk has done, and he's made Twitter a broadcasting outlet of course, now known as X, a broadcasting outlet. But why is that brilliant? Because if he can incorporate clipping the way YouTube has, where you could actually clip something in the video on the platform and people don't have to go into their phone and, 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 and do a screen grab from the phone and clip a, you know, a few seconds from the front and the back and then tweet it, you're right there on Twitter as is, right? If he could get an algorithm where you could clip 20 seconds like to 40, literally live retweeting while it's happening. Okay. Let's talk about something else. And this is the last segment for today. Uh, we will do a little bit of Q&A. But how many times have you went around and heard people talking about everyone in the world is today full of anxiety? And the world, the economics of the world today, the structure of the econ- economy is now causing everyone to be, you know, in fear of poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you see this all day and every day um, on different podcasts, on articles, and you say everyone's miserable and all that talk. Well, let me tell you something. All of that is the reflection of their heart. The physical external conditions will not alter that. If you brought in a whole new economy and you said it's totally fair, it will, it will not alter, you know, much of that. The reason that people are in a state of misery, the prime reason is that they have no connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala says, That there are things in this world that are the conduits of sakina. He says, Sakina is something that Allah only controls. I'm going to read again. Allah brings his sakina on his prophet and upon the mu'mineen. There are conduits of this sakina. Of course, number one being 
All right, staying away from the haram. Number two being dhikrillah. Another says, إِذْ يَقُولُوا لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا This ma'iyya of Allah is al-ma'iyya bil-sakina. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهُ وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا So why are people at peace? It's because, listen to this ayah. When the Prophet ﷺ said to his companion in the grave, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, لا تحزن, do not be sad. إن الله معنا, we have this withness. We are with Allah subhanahu wa Allah is with us. How is Allah with them? By bringing down Sakina upon him and supporting him with soldiers that you cannot imagine and that you cannot see. بجنود لم تره, what were the soldiers that helped the Prophet in the cave? A pigeon? A spider? And the angels. The angels calm them in the cave, surround their wings around them, and the pigeon built, laid the eggs, and the spider built a web. Okay? And those are the, and, and for them, Lam Taroha, because they physically didn't see that that um, pigeon did that and the spider web did that. Okay? Um, but the angels are the ones that you don't see. So Allah helps people calm down by Malaika. The presence of malaika, and that's something you, you change the economy. You're not going to bring malaika. You do uh, uh, everywhere you turn. If you pay attention, people are complaining about the spread of social anxiety like it's a disease, and that is not a spread of social anxiety. It's a lack of iman. They don't have iman, right? and they have no connection with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So what they anything they see, they're going to it, interpret it as a source of anxiety. Whereas the opposite. I don't know if you all remember the picture, but there was a raid, one of these IDF raids going on around the Aqsa area. Maybe it was Gaza. I can't even remember where it was. And you had a, a rickety old plastic chair, and on it was sitting an old Palestinian man with a gray beard and a, ku- and a kufi, right? And a thobe, right? And he's sitting there cross-legged with a misbah watching it all, Right? Not a single trace of anxiety on his face. And you had soldiers with guns ner- who were nervous, right? And you could see them taking two steps up, two steps back, yelling at each other, fleeing, right? Well, how is it that this man is... I, I wish, I really wish I had the picture. I think I deleted the picture, unfortunately. Let me see, actually, in my trash, if I have it. It's an amazing picture. But this... This is this is the, the the caption on it was amazing. Is that Sakina is something that Allah sends down to people. Okay. Allah sends it down to people. And these people then, no matter what situation they're in, all right, are in a state of Sakina, Rahma, mercy. All right. Let's go to down to trash. Recently deleted. It's one of the most amazing pictures you ever see. But that's uh, the source of Sakina is not going to be an external change, folks. It's not that. It's an internal change. And that's what people don't get. And they keep trying to change the outward. And all these Marxists in past history, they saw like the world is not good. It doesn't seem fair. Let's uh, set up some kind of revolution, blah, blah, blah. And none of that is solves anything. You just create more problems when you do that. قال الله لقد رضي الله عن المؤمنين إذ يبايعونك تحت الشجرة فعلم ما في قلوبهم فأنزل السكينة عليهم to have a good sentiment in your heart towards Allah and His Messenger and the believers and people okay Allah will bring sakina down upon you فعلم ما في قلوبهم he saw and Allah knows what's in their hearts فأنزل السكينة عليهم so then he brought the sakina down upon them وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا He gave them a reward of, a, of a, a imminent success. إِذْ جَعَلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْحَمِيَّةَ حَمِيَّةَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةَ And Allah placed in the hearts of the ignorant, okay, the, the hearts of the uh, disbelievers, the anger based upon ignorance, okay. فَأَنزَرَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَى رَسُولِهِ وَعَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ I mean... So many ayat about the Sakina. So uh, we'll stop here. Let's turn to our Q&A portion for now. And then we go to our dua on Monday.
All right. Let, let me let me tell you something about technology that's really weird. You spend about 20 minutes every few months deleting pictures from your phone because the phone tells you that it can't handle any more pictures. And you spend 20 minutes deleting, deleting, deleting. And then you feel that after 20 minutes, you feel like you achieved something, right? right? In reality, you haven't achieved anything. You just wasted 20 minutes of your life by necessity. All right, first question, Ahmed Z, read me a question. Lives of the prophets. Yes, one day we'll do lives of the prophets. Why not? What's wrong with that? What else we got? Does yawning come from shaitan? Yes, it's a sign of laziness, and a person should close their yawn upon themselves, not try to yawn out loud. And it is a... No, we can't say it's from shaitan, it's from exhaustion, but the prophet did say that shaitan urinates in the mouth of the person who yawns with his mouth open. Okay. What do I do, uh, says OG Muslima, in these weddings that are have so much munkar in them? I just step out, right? I go there, right? I accept the invitation. And as soon as the munkar starts, I go take a walk, yeah. right? I come back, I eat the dinner. I leave my gift. I say hello to the people I need to say hello to. Then I go back again, right? Outside, hang out with my friends outside. Find a little prayer room. And we wherever you know, they tuck you in a little room to make salah, you go there, you pray there. Okay. And you hang out with your friends. Go and get some dessert. Come back out. And if once it gets like they're absolutely crazy, then you just leave. Can you talk about prophets? Can you talk about futuwa? Yes, why not? Is taking welfare from the government halal? Yes. What's the sunnah and the best process for presenting yourself and intentions to get to know someone that you're interested in marriage? I would say that maybe you could use a middleman to go and represent you for the first time. Let's say like, for example, um, so-and-so is very interested in you. Are you, you want to talk? And then they say yes or no. They're going to tell you yes or no, right? And so using a middleman is probably the best way to get a start. Can you hunt squirrels and eat them? Yes, you can. Are they rodents? But they're, they're generally clean, so they're not going to fall in the karahia of rats and bats. You can eat squirrel. I've always said to my kids, we're going to go out camping and, and, and hunt squirrel. Right? But you need to hunt like five squirrels to actually eat because they're so skinny. Right? There's no meat on here. If the only effective pain medication for a terminally ill person clouds the mind, um, some of these medications are drugs. There's no different difference there are mind altering drugs and the mind altering drug is forbidden in islam but you may it's not nejus so you may take a small amount that does not alter your mind like percocet it's not nejus so in its that the essence of it is not forbidden but it's the mind altering degree that's forbidden so you take a small amount that doesn't alter the mind um Atikra, Atik Rahman out of Philly tells us don't eat those city squirrel. Yeah, because they're probably dirty. No doubt about that. Is it possible to self study Mutun? Don't self stu study stuff unless you do plan to get a teacher. Then you can self study in the beginning. But then when you sit with your teachers, don't say, Oh, I know this. He said, Sheikh tells you every time he tells you something, Oh, I know this. Don't say that. Okay. When you sit with your shiuk, pretend you don't know anything. Okay? Otherwise, the sheikh starts to not say stuff because he imagines that you already know it. Okay? Let me tell you this. One of the main reasons why people do not succeed is because they want to do something themselves. Now, you may have to do something yourself, which is fine, and you could do that, but you have to get the intention of getting a teacher. You can study Shafi Fiqh at arcview.org. The reason we made Arcview is so that every time we talk about studying... We have a resource to send people over, and it's such an efficient resource.
You get a calendar. All the classes are recorded. They're right there. You get a WhatsApp group. It's so efficient. People have put their time in ArcView. They have learned. All right? They really have benefited. So arcview.org, and you should wait for a few more days to see um, the website because it will be up and running. Let's, let's see if they put it up now, actually. I don't think they did, but arcview.org, the new website is going to be so pretty. No, they didn't. It still redirects to myarcview.org. All right, so myarcview is the portal where all the classes are at. But the classes are always on Zoom, and they're, they're on Zoom, and the, there's a portal that records all the classes. And the discussion happens in each discussion group, WhatsApp group. So there's a Aqidah WhatsApp group, a Maliki Fiqh WhatsApp, which I'm, I have to catch up on. There's a Tasawwuf WhatsApp group, Hanafi Fiqh WhatsApp group, Hanbali Fiqh WhatsApp group. We mainly focus, and there's a Hadith WhatsApp group. And a Tajweed WhatsApp group, right? So we mainly focus on this. Sheikh Mahdi Lak will be teaching Arabic. Okay. So why people don't succeed in life is that they're too afraid, too hesitant, or too arrogant to take on a teacher and obey that teacher, right? That's why they don't succeed. People, it doesn't take a lot of brains to actually achieve stuff in life, my personal opinion. I really don't think it takes a lot of brains to be an achiever in life. It doesn't take a lot of energy to be an achiever in life. What it does take is the right teachers and the right mentors and the humility to do exactly what the mentor tells you to do. Okay? And do it. How do you control your desires? Great question. The best way to control your desires is to not have to control your desires. Right? The best way to control your desires is to put yourself in a situation, in an environment where you don't have to be disciplined, right? The most disciplined people, the environment does the disciplining for them. So you're not going to go now. At, we are at Rutgers campus here, and it's the middle of August. Well, in a few weeks, all the students will be back, and the weather's hot, and you go out there, and you sit on one of these lawns, and you say, I'm going to recite the Quran. Well, on the lawn is all sorts of half-naked people sitting around, right? Right? And say, oh, we need to be disciplined and lower my gaze. All right? You put yourself in an environment that's almost impossible to lower your gaze. You literally are set up to fail. We are, we have, we here being in America, we are almost set up to fail. Like just to be neutral, you have to put in so much effort. And you have to create these, these, these little environments. But, and that's one of the things I'm telling you. When I was at uh, Yale and I was at working, I was I was seeing myself and all the other Muslims slowly, really, truly going, becoming more and more liberal, more and more loose. Very small increments, very small increments, right? And then the biggest contrast for me was the Muslims in jails that just came out of jail to go to Masjid al-Islam. And these guys had beards down to here and were practicing every sunnah that they learned about. And I said, well, these guys, they're, they're jahil. They barely know two things about Islam, but they have more zeal and taqwa and love of the sunnah. And I became embarrassed, to be honest with you. And I said, there's no solution to this. Trap yourself in the masjid. You got to trap yourself in the masjid. It's got to be my nine to five job. Because Yale and stuff, you will obey the person who writes you the check. Forget Yale, Trinity, in general. It's not just about Yale. It's all the universities. You will obey and you will live according to the person who writes you the check. Right, So how can I be in a situation where my income is actually dependent upon practicing the deen and being in the house of Allah? So if you can put yourself in an environment where you don't have to have discipline, that's the smartest thing to do. Because it, to, to, to go against your environment is against nature. It's not the natural way to, to live. Okay. And it's not something that you could do forever. So, so alter your environment. Alter your companions. Who do you hang out with? Don't ever be alone. Like a lot of these kids in college, they say, well, what do I do? I said, don't be alone. Study, study with a good group. Eat, go out and eat with some, with some good guys. Got nothing to do? Go out to the masjid and study there, right? Here's a question for you. Does a female need a sheikh? Uh, do you need a sheikh in your life as a woman? You need, we need mentors. Okay. 
If I need to do dhikr and I want to advance in dhikr, I need a program. Say these awrat, you're good to go. Okay. If I need fiqh, okay, this is the book we're studying right now. All right. If I need fitness, all right, this is the amount of running we're going to do right now. This is when we're going to eat. This is when we're not going to eat. That's what you need. So it, it does it have to be something where it, the sheikh is in your life 100 all day and all night? No. But do I have... Do, am I getting direction? Yes, that's th that we do need. We need direction. And don't be arrogant or lazy or afraid and say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to do it myself. The do it yourself, you end up staying just like yourself. You don't change. What's the best way to do the miss raka and jama'ah? You get up, you owe the recitation that you missed. So if you prayed three rakas with the imam for Aisha, but you missed the first rakah. So what do you owe now? You owe the recitation of the first rakah. That means out loud with a surah. You owe that. But then the bottom half of the salah will be the same. So fourth rakah is tashahud and tahiyyah and salam out. Okay. Do you guys have hadith class? This semester we don't have a hadith class. I, had, I taught it last year, but this year it's a tafsir class by Sheikh Nuh Saunders. Is there a rim limit on writing fiction and poetry? I think can you? I think that um, you just have to make sure that you're not writing something unlawful. That's it. If your parents are emotionally abusive, how much do you have to respect them and listen to them? Yeah, you still have to respect them and listen to them despite how much they abuse you. And as you grow up, you can protect yourself from harm that you can do. But you still have to respect them and not upset them. Do the effects of sin still reach you after Toba? They do, but Toba is not just one thing. It's not a switch. Toba is degrees. You notice how Allah Subhanahu, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Juma to Juma is a kafara. Wudu to Wudu is a kafara. Okay? Every time you read Quran, you're wiping away sins. Every time you fast, Yom Arafah, you're wiping away sins. Every time you fast, Muharram. Ashura, you're wiping away a year of sins. Every time you go to Umrah, Umrah, you're wiping away a lot of sins. You go to Hajj, you wipe away a lot of sins. So when you're when you're making Toba, the first Toba is that you're 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 seeking forgiveness for intending to do this wrong and doing this wrong. So that's that's the first level of it. But every time you do these deeds, you're washing away your past, washing away your past, washing away your past until even the effects that you have earned of your sins get washed away. So just, okay, astaghfirullah for doing that, but I'm not going to, but don't do any more good deeds and not much dhikr or sadaqah or anything. Then no, the effects are still going to come to you. But when you start getting more pious and more righteous and doing good deeds and putting effort in, you start also wiping away the bad effects of those sins. That's the beauty of it. Uh, turquoise says I dislike systematic study uh, you need systematic study whether we like it or not we do really need to have um, a system to our study okay show me one institution of achievement the medical field the legal field the engineering field show me one where it's not systematic okay you know what's not systematic the field of art. You know who's poor? Artists. Okay? It's not systematic. Right? Okay. Neither is your income. Right? So neither is your benefit that you give to the world. I don't know what artists are going to do and photographers now that AI takes creates better pictures. Right? Right now. But why do I why would I need to ever get a photographer? Right? And get a photographer for the moment. Right for a wedding or something, yes. But if I need actually to, to, to get a picture of a nice sunset, hey, I can make that for me. I need to go download a picture. A guy waited there for eight hours to take the picture of a deer or something or of a gazelle running in the, in the woods. Well, I can, AI makes that in two seconds, right? So in any event, I'm, just, I'm not totally making fun of artists, but I'm saying you, you may dislike it, but it's good for you. 
And if you dislike something that's good for you, decrease the dosage. So be systematic for 10 minutes a day. That's it. You don't have to be systematic for the whole 12 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours that you're awake. That, that may be too much for someone. Decrease, be systematic for 10 minutes a day. Is UIF halal? I've seen many imams use UIF. I learned in the next question. Didi says, I learned medical fiqh if a woman enters a marriage, but before consummation, while engaged to another man, that the original suitor can go to a qadi and have the marriage ended. True? I don't know if he could, if, he, if she's engaged to one man, then she goes and marries another man. I don't know if a qadi will dissolve the second marriage. I don't know about that. I have to look that up. Should Muslims visit Karbala? Sheikh Asra said they shouldn't and should go to Egypt instead where the head of Hussein is. Yes. Yes. Reading Surah Yasin 41 times to re remove difficult these is it an authentic practice. Well, I heard it was 40 times, but no, it's not something that is a sunnah. It is something that is mujarrab. And we act upon the mujarrabat. Mujarrab means someone tried it and found it beneficial. Likewise, is saying Hasbi Allah when Yaman Wakil 450 times a day for 40 straight days. Those are one of the examples of Mujarrabat. They're not in the Sunnah. There's no special reward for it, but someone tried it at some point and it worked for him. So we are allowed to act upon that. But we're not allowed to believe that there's a special reward to it, like the Tasbih after Salah or uh, things that the Prophet specified specifically. How do I make Toba? Toba is in your heart. It has four conditions. Regret what you've done. Admit what you've done. Seek Allah's forgiveness for what you've done. And make the intention never to return to that action again. What's the Madiki ruling on pictures? The prohibition comes upon something that has two qualities. Quality number one, it's the complete being such that it could live like that. Like the whole being. For example, a, the, a person's head only. Can a person survive with just a head? No, of course not. But can they survive with everything minus a hand? Yes, that could survive. So the question is, can it survive like that? That's number one. Condition number two, It's three. it has a shadow. It's three-dimensional or has a shadow. If it has both of those qualities, it's haram. If it has one of those qualities, it's makru. If it has neither of those qualities, it's halal. I heard some Sufis say that Sayyidina Isa is the son of Prophet Muhammad. That is ridiculous. No. That is absurd. He's the younger brother in Nubuwa. The Prophet Muhammad, All the prophets are brothers. And hence, they are, they are brothers. And the Prophet Sallallahu came later, right? So they are brothers in Nubuwa. Okay. But what we do hold is that who is the husband of the Virgin Mary in Jannah? The Prophet ﷺ. So you want to say stepson? Right. What are the benefits of reading Darud Tanjina? If you read that Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad salatan tunjina biha min jami'i lahwali wa lafat wa taqdilana biha jami'i hajat ila akhirihi You see those are individual dua. And you get those du'a in general and in specific. That is the value of that. You're mixing salah on the Prophet and du'a. Each one of those is a du'a. I don't always feel yearning for the Prophet, but I love sending salah upon him. Is this wrong? No. The, the, the love of the Prophet ﷺ has two levels, rational and natural. And the rational love is that I know that I should be devoting my time and energy to the Prophet ﷺ. That's what we're asked upon to do. That's what we're asked. And as for... The heart, it will follow when it follows. Okay. Okay. It is, it is not a theory that the Prophet ﷺ will marry Sayyidah Maryam. It is a narration. Yeah. And, and what man has the... Uh, uh, what man has the... Uh, who is most qualified to marry the greatest woman who has lived? Sayyidah Maryam. Now, it can't be Prophet Ibrahim because that's his granddaughter. For obviously, with many, many, many fathers in between. But still, 
Sayyidina Maryam is from the lineage of Prophet Ibrahim, right? Mm -hmm. So who then is remaining? There is Prophet Musa, Prophet Dawood, Prophet Sulaiman, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Well, whose ummah gives victory to her son? Did the ummah of Musa alayhi salam give victory to her son? Or they tried to, 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 to disbelieve and kill her son and get his Sayyidina Isa bin Maryam executed by the Romans. Yes, they tried to do that, right? So the ummah that gives victory to her son, that prophet is most worthy, right? And, and hence the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the a husband Sayyidina Maryam is the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah you know the Christians I've never seen them like flip out about that they must not know it they must not know it okay alright let's go to our dua of akhir uh, of, of Yom Al-Arbi'a Bain Al-Dhuhri Wal Asri you all know that we do a dua after Dhuhr and uh, the dua between Dhuhr and Asr on Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala, is an accepted dua. And it's always a time where a person should make dua at this hour, at this time, any time at this hour. Um, between Dhuhr and Asr, and you never know, it's a hidden time. It may have passed already, may have not passed, maybe right now. But if you hit it every single, the same time, every single Wednesday, then chances are that you'll hit that hour someday throughout the year, inshallah. And the proof of this is it's in many different hadiths and it happened to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, where the messenger, peace be upon him, made dua on Monday and on Tuesday and then he made dua on Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr and it was answered. And so Jabir ibn Abdullah, the narrator of that hadith and the witness to it, uh, said that he held it to be and he knew that this would forever be a time of answered prayers. And so hence, uh, we want to take advantage of that. And anyone who has a need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should always take it to Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La ilaha illallah al-Maliku al-Haqq al-Mubin. 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 Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا وكان عند الله وجيها وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين وجهت وجيها للذي فطر السماوات والأرض بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمتان نضربها للناس العالم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم أعيد نفسي بالله تعالى من كل ما يسمع بأذنين ويبصر بعينين ومشي برجلين ويبطش بيدين وتكلم بشفتين حصنت نفسي بالله الخالق الأكبر من شر ما أخاف وأحذر من الجن والإنس ويحضرون عز جاره وجل ثناؤه وتقدست أسماؤه ولا إله غيره الله من يجارك في نهر آدائي وعذ بك من شرورهم وتعيودهم ومكرهم ومكائدهم أطفئ نار من أراد بعداوة من الجن والإنس يا حافظ يا حفيظ يا كافي يا محيط سبحانك يا رب ما أعظم شأنك وعز سلطانك تحصنت بالله بسماء الله بآيات الله ملائكة الله أنبياء الله ورسل الله والصالحين من بعد الله حصنت نفسي بلا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم الله محرسني بعينك التي لا تنام وكنفني بكنفك الذي لا يرام ورحمني بقدرتك علي فلا أهلك وأنت تقتنا ورجاءنا يا غياث المستغيثين 
يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث المستغيثين يا دارك الهالكين يا دارك الهالكين يا دارك الهالكين اكفني شر كل طارق يطرق بليل او نهار الا طارق يطرق بخير انك على كل شيء قدير بسم الله ارقي نفسي من كل ما يؤذي ومن كل حاسد الله شفائي بسم الله رقيت اللهم رب الناس اذف الباس اشفي انت الشافي وعافي انت المعافي لا شفاء الا شفاؤك شفاء لا يغادر سقما ولا الما يا كافي يا وافي يا حميد يا مجيد الفاني كل تعب شديد واكفني من الحد والحديد والمرض الشديد والجيش العديد وجعلي نورا من نورك وعزا من عزك ونصرا من نصرك وبهاء من بهائك وعطاء من عطائك وحراسة من حراستك وتأييدا من تأييدك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام والمواهب العظام أسألك أن تكفني من شرك وليذي شر إنك أنت الله الخالق الأكبر وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والحمد لله رب العالمين ظاهرا وباطنا وعلى كل حان يا أرحم الراحمين Take a few minutes for dua
صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Jesus.